T today, Baptism Sunday, of course, it's a big deal, but this is the last in the series where we're talking about fanning the flame. And so uh, we're, now last week we talked about there's a lot of things that can cool us off. You guys know that there's stuff to cool us off. Well, today we're going to talk about the, the one thing that can really just, just add a lot of heat to our lives. And so we're going we're gonna to really talk about being connected, okay? So, uh, matter of fact, all of you guys know this too, that the people you hang out with, you become like them. You tell your kids this all the time, right? Now, so some, some peculiar things I've heard this week, and I thought it was interesting. Number one, today is National Ice Cream Sunday. That makes me happy. That makes me very happy, very happy. So uh, National Ice Cream, I didn't even know there was such a thing. I saw that, I was like, oh, hallelujah, this is my holiday, I like that. Second thing, I guess those huge metal discs covering the sewers on your streets, those big old metal discs, we can't call those manholes anymore. Apparently now that's sexist. And they can't interchange man-woman on the front of that because that won't go good either, you know. You can just play that in your head if you want to, but don't do it out loud. You, See, you, you didn't even get it till just now, huh? And uh, uh, there, there's a new app, the Face app, where you can make yourself look older. We've been doing it wrong the whole time, right? Now, I personally don't need it. My mirror is doing a fine job, right? But my favorite one of the whole week, the best one, is apparently over one million people are going to storm Area 51 because the government is holding extraterrestrials hostage. Now, I was going to say aliens, but that's a different story, right? And so now, now here's what's funny about this is that I don't know what they, they, they think, but Area 51 is a top secret military weapons testing base. And one million millennials who can't make their bed. <laughs> so, so what are you trying to say? Well, here, here's the deal. I am so glad I'm not part of that herd. Okay? But I am glad I'm part of this herd. Everybody say the herd. The herd. See, now here, here's the deal. So we, we, we like to call the people of new life, we like to call us the herd, right? Now, don't, don't get your feelings hurt. Don't, don't take this and get weird with this. Say, Pastor Dave, call us a cow. That's not what I'm trying to talk about, right? So we, we like to refer to us as a herd because here's what we know. We know that life is at its best when we do life together. And we also know that we are the most vulnerable when we're duped into trying to do life alone. That's a bad idea. A few years ago, uh, a bunch of guys from New Life, we, we, we made the decision we were going to go climb Mount Whitney, tallest point in the continental United States, 14,500 feet, something like that. So, uh, so it, 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 it's a two-day climb up this mountain. It's, it, it's a long ways. And uh, we, we gave all the guys a list of some some essential equipment that they're going to have to have to, to make that journey. And so just not a lot of really big stuff, but, but, but some of the stuff on the list was like you, you need a first aid kit because, you know, something bad might happen. Or when you, 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 need, you need a knife and you need, uh, well, you need, need matches and, and, of course, you need a flashlight and those kind of things. But the, 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 the one piece of, of, uh, of equipment on that list that got the most questions was we told them we needed a a 25-foot length of rope, 25-foot. Now, that's not really mountain climbing equipment kind of stuff, but 25-foot length. So they said, well, well, what's the rope for? And so the answer was, you need the 25-foot piece, piece of rope in case somebody falls off the trail because the trails are really, like, scary and there's, there's cliffs and lots of places, very dangerous kind of stuff. And, and so they said, well, well, how will the rope help me because it's only 25 feet? How will it help me if I fall off the off the trail. I said, it, it, it won't help you. Like, what? Then why do I need the rope? What's the point? What do I do if I fall off the trail? Hope the other guy brought his rope. Okay? See, here's the thing. Because everybody at some point or another needs to be rescued. Everybody. 
Nobody is a lone wolf. It really doesn't work that way. Nobody's a lone wolf. Everybody at some point in life, at least once, is going to need to be rescued. Matter of fact, today, you know, Loretta shared about her brother and, and the story, that kind of stuff. We want to share some of his story with you because this is a rescue story that you, New Life, had a huge part in. So we want to show you part of that story today. So watch, watch, watch the screens, if you would, please. Hi, my name is Dennis. I'm a Loretta's little brother. I was diagnosed with ARDS, which is a bad lung infection. It gets into your bloodstream and you're pretty much uh, dead after that. The doctors put me in a coma and I was in a coma for six weeks. They said I had a 2% chance of living. And they kept asking my wife to unplug me because there would be no life worth living. And my wife kept telling them no. So faith of God was really working with her. They told me that once I woke up, and they were surprised that I did wake up, and I was able to breathe on my own that I would never talk again and walk again or move again. The first words I said to the doctor was water, and he was amazed that I even said that. What do you want to drink? Water. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love you so much. Okay. You know, the spirit was working in me. I was in a lot of pain. And he told me to just work through the pain and that will get you through. That would be your motive. I, standing here before you, as a miracle of God, because I died on the table, zero brain function. So I rose from the dead. Right up probably out of every prayer warrior there was in the world, praying for me. They did, uh, they did pray for me in the miracle, it did happen. So the prayer is a testimony to miracles that does happen. I want to thank you all for who prayed for me. I want you to get the gravity of this. Is the, the doctors told his wife to, to unplug him because there's no hope. They, she was told, look, there, there's no point. And uh, for weeks before that, Loretta would come to you and she would tell you, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, because, because you prayed. And so while he was on the table, the doctor actually looked at the clock, called the time of death, called it. But he is part of our New Life family here now. So you partnered with us, prayed for a guy that you've never met, prayed for a family, you rescued a family for, literally from the jaws of death. See, that's what it means to be part of the herd. See, that's, that's the power of it. See, that's how God does incredible things is when you're connected to a body of Christ, it does so much, so much more. So, so the reason I'm saying this, we, we've all had situations where, where people said, hey, bro, got your back. And when times got tough, you looked behind you and there was nobody back there. We, we know what that's like, right? As a matter of fact, unless you're on the back row, there's somebody behind you right now. But that doesn't mean anything. As a matter of fact, some of you people, you, you've never saw them before in your life. If you look back there, it's like, hey, hey, right? So, so that really does mean, so here's the deal. Isn't it so much better to have somebody standing with us yes. than somebody standing behind us? As a matter of fact, when I'm going through a hard place, guess what? I would much rather have somebody standing alongside of me rather than somebody standing behind me. I think it's a lot safer that way, right? See, life is best lived in circles, not in rows. That's why it's so important to be connected. Okay, now, now along the journey of life, we take hits along the way. Most of those hits we can take, except some of those come from what we'll call friendly fire. Anybody ever been wounded by somebody that you loved or, or that said that they loved you, right? The friendly fire. So we get that kind of stuff. Now, now, matter of fact, that was, that was uh, David's struggle because he says this in Psalm chapter 55. He said, you know what? If it would have been an enemy, I could have took it. But because it was my friend, 
Wow, I just don't know. So what happens is, is it's in those places where we, we allow our hearts to be vulnerable and we, we get wounded in the process. That's where everything changes. Now all of a sudden our hearts are guarded. Trust doesn't come easy. We're not standing shoulder to shoulder, but we keep everything at a distance. In fact, that's even what happened to the, the Apostle Peter after Jesus was arrested. He said he still followed Jesus, but he followed at, at a distance, right? So now, so it's, so instead of being part of the herd, we have this tendency to want to be the loner. Want to kind of do it on our own because of something we, we've, we've experienced. And this, there's something about that loner thing that kind of calls to us sometimes. You're like, you know what, we like, I'm, a, I'm the lone wolf. And we, we say that with pride, or you know, soul survivor, or the, or the action hero, or, or the superhero. But the problem is, okay, it's a, the superhero is a fictional character because they're not real. The action hero is just somebody in a movie because that that's, that's, doesn't actually happen, right? The lone wolf is the only guy that didn't get killed on the team. Okay, and wolves travel in packs. So, so much for the, for, for the loner idea. So, now, since the dawn of time, mankind has always done the significant stuff when he works in conjunction with other people. That's the best stuff. Matter of fact, most of the time people get in trouble, it's when we try to do stuff on our own. Anybody who got that t-shirt know what I'm talking about. When you try to act on your own, hey, I got this, it didn't go good, right? So, so it's, it's actually those times that really matters. Now, in our, our, our modern time of, of technology and ultra-connected, this kind of stuff, in a, in a lot of ways, our lives are easier, but in some ways, it's actually not better. So instead of sitting on our front porch and sharing stories, now we don't even sit together at all. We're glued to our screen, right? So in, in, instead of getting together, we prefer to sit in different rooms alone. Instead of having conversations, we text. Instead of helping each other, we avoid each other. See, sometimes I think that we're so concerned we're going to miss something here. We're missing everything there. So can I encourage you to look up? See the people around you. Look up and find the God above you. Look up and find out that you're missing a whole lot. It's not good to be alone. Matter of fact, Proverbs says this. Proverbs 18.1 said, said, He who keeps himself separate for his own private purpose goes against everything that makes sense. It that doesn't make sense at all. See, see, the problem with isolation, isolation requires me to be the smartest person in the room every time. And I don't know about you, but there's a whole lot of times I know that's not true at all. Right? How many of you guys know you are not always the smartest person? Raise your hand, Zach. I'm talking to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so you guys get what we're talking about. So, see, we were created to do be our, our best as a unit. So this drive for isolation and privacy and, and to be independent that pushes life into the shadows. When we push life into the shadows, that's oftentimes where we become the casualties because we suffer in silence, stumbling through the dark. And, see, and so sometimes instead of just being the wound E, sometimes we can become the wound er just because we're moving at the, at the speed of life, right? So now, so the struggle in keeping our distance from one another, this is where I want to get with this. The struggle is that instead of living shoulder to shoulder or side by side, the struggle is when we are alone, the enemy exploits our weakness. He exploits our weakness. Now, now watch this. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 15 through, through uh, uh, verse, verse 17. I want to read this uh, all the way through, right? So in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 15, it says, Once again the Philistines were at war with Israel. And when David, David the giant killer, remember this guy? When David and his men were in the thick of the battle, David became weak and exhausted. Anybody ever been weak and exhausted? Isn't that the time when we, when we like to be alone, when we're weak and exhausted? Terrible idea. Watch this. So David became weak and exhausted. Exhausted. Verse 16. Ishbi Benob was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds. Now think about this. Think about this. The head of his spear weighed the same as a sledgehammer. He doesn't have to stab you, just hit you. Okay? It weighed seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword... He had cornered David and was about to kill him. But Abishai, but Abishai, one of his mighty men, one of, one of the guys hanging with Now, Abishai didn't have fantastic character. Abishai was that friend. He was always saying stuff. Anybody got a friend that does that? 
he just blurts stuff out, you know? You know, is, he, he's the kind of, if somebody's late for work, he's the guy that drives off without them. He's that guy. Anybody got a friend like that? So Abishai said, but Abishai, son of Zeruiah, came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. And David's men declared, you are not going out to battle with us again. Why risk snuffing out the light in Israel? See, see the giants in our lives exploit the times of weakness. And when, the, when we, they exploit the times, of, the, the, the times of weakness, what happens sometimes is our candle could be blown out. Because there's no Abishai standing with us. That's why it's not good to do this on your own, right? So, so here, here's what's important. So Goliath is not the name of your giant. Goliath is the size of your giant. Your giant's name is something like fear or defeat or resentment. Your giant's name is, is anger or failure or unforgiveness. Your giant's, giant's name is, is loss or grief or self-image or some medical report and on and on. See, you're, that's your giant. So, so don't be deceived that your independence and getting alone and your privacy, don't be deceived that that is your safety zone because, my friend, that is not a safety zone because when the battle gets hot and heavy and the enemy is on your back, those are the times when you become a casualty because there's no Abishai standing next to you. Am I getting through to you guys at all? Okay, so, so what I'm saying is that we're in this together. I'm not telling you to put yourself out there. That's just dumb. I'm not telling you to step back into something dangerous. Matter of fact, some of these ladies that have been in abusive relationships, they say, are you trying to tell me to go back? No, I'm trying to tell you to kill him. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, but, but you know what I'm saying. So that's not what I'm saying. What, what I'm saying is that we, the herd, we're in this together. We're in this together. In World War II, towards the end of the war, it wasn't going well at all for the Allies. As a matter of fact, it looked like we were losing pretty bad. Until one thing happened that was just lucky for the Allies, just fate, I guess, but, but Rommel's German Army Tank Division was just absolutely decimating the Allies completely, wiping them out. But the battle took a turn for the worst for Rommel, the best for the Allies, because Rommel out outran his resources. He literally got so far out there, he literally, honestly ran out of gas. Anybody ever run out of gas? It doesn't matter how many times you turn that car over, it is not starting, right? He ran out of gas, so he outran his resources. And when we outrun the source of our strength, we become prey to our weakness. You get what I'm talking about? And so like David, Rommel became too weak to win. And that's when everything turns. See, here's what it says. We're the herd. So it's in 1 Peter chapter 5 where it says this in, in, in verse 8. It says, be self-controlled and be alert because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He said, oh, we need to be afraid. No, that's not what he's saying. He said, see, what happens is fear drops right in the middle of our weak, weakest areas. How many of you guys know what your weakness is, right? Fear will drop right in the middle of that and then watch the reaction. So the, the lion, your enemy, the adversary will watch your reaction and he's waiting for someone when that happens. He's waiting for fear to strike your hearts and for you to isolate yourself from the herd. And when you isolate yourself from the herd, you become prey to the lion. That's how it works. So the roars that we hear, the whispers into our hearts about us and others and tell us that we have to isolate. It devours our hope, devours our joy, devours our faith, and we don't have anything left. See, the herd surrounds you and guards you. That's what it does. The, the, the herd is with you. And when you're part of the herd, we stand together. That's what we do. That's what rescued David. Even though David had killed giants, there came a time in his life, not just because he was old, not just because he was tired, but there came a time in his life that even though he had killed giants in the past, he got himself in a situation where his weaknesses were exposed and the giant was trying to kill him. And had it not been for an Abishai. So, so here's what I'm saying. We're, we're, we'll finish this up right here. Do you have a group of people around you that are helpful now, not, not just your family. Your family loves you because they have to. It's true, huh? 
I mean, nobody else is going to show you that kind of grace, right? But I'm talking about some accountability, somebody that will ask you good questions, somebody that will pray for you, somebody that will give you good advice, somebody that you can talk to. Do you have an Abishai standing next to you? I don't know about this, but are you curious where Abishai came from? This is interesting. David was in a situation where he had married Saul's daughter, the king. So they're sitting at the dinner table, and Saul, his father-in-law, got jealous of David. And one night at dinner, now, now this, check it out, read it yourself. One night at dinner, David's father-in-law, at the dinner table, threw a spear at him. There's some dinner conversation. That's right. Soon, got a problem, Dad? Right? Threw a spear at him. So David, because he was full of incredible spiritual discernment, decided it was time to go. <laughs> Not everybody catches on to that stuff, but I mean... So he ran away from his father-in-law because he was afraid his father was going to kill him. And that, that's true. Now, now, here's, now, just to be fair... Throughout the years, there's probably been several father-in-laws that want to kill their son-in-laws. It's probably happened a few times, right? So David runs away, and he hides in a cave. David isolates himself. But because God's got a plan for David and his life, because God's got a plan for his future, when David tries to isolate himself, God sends him help. Aren't you glad God sends you help? So you get in a tough spot and say, man, my father-in-law's throwing spears at me at dinner. This is bad. My family's falling apart. I don't know what to do. So you run away and you hide yourself. And while you're in your hiding place, God says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to send you help. All right, hallelujah, praise God. So who does God send him? Okay, God says, I'm going to send you everyone who was in debt up to their eyeballs. I'm going to send you everyone who was discontent with everything in their life. I'm going to send you everybody that hates everything about their life. I'm going to send you the worst lot of people you've ever had in your life to help you and encourage you. Thank you, Jesus. Now what happens when God sends help our way, we look at the exterior and we disqualify them. Because I don't know if you know this, but when you're in trouble, God will send you jacked up people to help you. Anybody got any jacked up friends? Come on, God will send you jacked up people to help you. Now what we do is we misinterpret that. We think God sends us jacked up people because we got to make jacked up people less jacked up. But that's not how a herd works. I help you, and you help me. We gain courage and strength and joy in the fight for our faith. So David took this ragtag group of misfits and turned them into mighty men of valor. Not because of their talent, but because of their love for one another and their love for God. And at a time of distress when a big guy by the name of Ishbi Binah was trying to kill David off, one of those misfits stepped out of the herd, stepped up to the battle and killed that giant and rescued his leader. Why? Because we are part of the herd. We are in this together. We do life with one another. You get what I'm talking about? So what I'm trying to say is, are you part of the herd? Look around, my friends. Do not isolate yourself. That is the most dangerous thing you can do. When the battle gets hot and heavy, dig in. Here's talking about small groups all the time. We're not trying to promote a program. We're trying to save your life. Yeah. I'm, I'm not into small groups. So you're into dying? What? I don't want nobody knowing my stuff. Why? That's a good question. I just like my me time. Shut up, you big baby. I'll see you at Area 51. That was wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> the herd surrounds you. The herd guards you. The herd stands with you. Because we're the herd. 
where the rescued become the rescuers. So let, let, let's finish. You can't kill giants in the shadows. You can't kill giants in the shadows. Here's what you already know. You already know that you're facing giants. You already know that. You already know that some, some people here, you're facing rejection, and you're trying to, to get over that. Some people, it's a self-esteem issue. You know, I, don't, I don't know what's wrong with me. Why can't I get this? Some of you, it's, it's, it's anger. Some of you, it's, it's resentment because of things. That are, some of you, it's unforgiveness. Some of you are facing some stuff where you, where you failed. Some of you are, are facing some stuff where you know, I feel like I've lost everything. Here's what I'm saying. You can't kill those giants standing in the shadows. So what do you do? You step into the herd and into the light and you allow God to do some incredible things and bring you back into the herd where you're supposed to be. If you slipped into the shadows, it's time to come back to the herd. So I'm going to finish with this. If you feel like you've fallen off the trail, We're going to throw you a rope and pull you back in. Because we are the herd. That's what we do. I thought about this. What, what happens if I, if, if I fall further than 25 feet? Somebody else is going to come and they're going to add theirs to mine. And we'll do what we have to do because what we're going to do, if you're falling off the trail, we're going to throw you a rope. We're going to pull you back. Could I get you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment, please? If you're sitting in this room today, and you feel like you're falling off the trail, that's probably the best way to describe it. You need somebody to throw your rope, pull you back. I know for certain that there's people in this room, you're trying to recover from a broken relationship. You put on a pretty good plastic smile, but beneath that surface, you're struggling. I know that there's people in this room they are struggling with a failure that you've been beating yourself up for a long time. I know there's people in this room, the things that have happened where you are so resentful and unforgiving that it's eating you alive. I can go on and on, but see, here's the thing. We're flowing, throwing you a rope today. It's time to come home. So while every head is bowed, everybody's eyes are closed here for just a moment. If you feel like I've been talking to you, we don't want you to stand up. We don't want you to come to the front, nothing like that. But if you feel like I've been talking to you while every head is bowed, everybody's eyes are closed, just simply just raise your hand up real fast and put it right back down. Say, that's me, Pastor Dave. It's me. That's where I'm at. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know there's more. Don't, don't worry, don't, you don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about it. We're not going to point you out. You say, looking inside, I feel like I'm broken. I'm trying to recover. Show me a hand real fast. Come on, real fast. Up and right back down. Thank you, thank you. Could y'all stand today, please? Good news, bad news. Bad news, today won't make everything perfect. You're still going to be a little bit broken for a while. I'm encouraging that way, huh? Good news. Become part of the herd, you'll get a little stronger every day. You'll get a little stronger every day. And it's coming a day when you'll look back on this day and you won't even be able to remember how broken you were. That's what the healing power of God can do. Can I just throw this in there? I got, I got a couple minutes, but... Have you noticed that people can be somewhat disappointing? Come on, think about it. How many of you guys know some people that's like, you know, I thought they were going to be this? Like, no, wow, they disappointed me, right? How many guys have been disappointed by some people this week? Come on, come on, come, come on, stranger. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, have a, I have a number one people rule. Here's my number one people rule. People are stupid. 
You know that, right? When you allow for that, it's just, just it's, it, you don't get hurt near as bad. But see, people are disappointing. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5 says this. Tribulation produces patience. Patience produces perseverance. Perseverance produces hope. And hope can't be disappointed. So if you're disappointed, just watch what God's going to do. Just watch. Okay, as we finish this up today, I don't want to assume that everything is good between you and Jesus. Because that's where it starts. With a strong relationship with Jesus. And what happens sometimes, sometimes people are like, well, I'm not sure about the church thing yet. That's fine. Did you know that it's okay to go here and not know Jesus? It's okay. I don't know how you can do that for a long time, but I mean, it, it, it's okay. And also, there's times when you can like wander away or even get pushed away. In fact, some, some of the deepest hurts sometimes happen in churches. I know that. But today, we'd like to invite you back. All right? So what we're going to do right now is just, just as a group, we're going, to, we're going to pray this prayer. And I'd like you to pray this prayer with me. Now, if you don't mean it, it's, it's just words. But if you mean it, it's life-changing. Life-changing. So we're going to pray a prayer and in, invite Jesus in. That's the prayer we're going to pray. We're going to invite him in. And if you like, like, like wandered away, this, this is your first day home. If you're apprehensive about it, not sure, this might be your first day. Saying, oh, I don't believe all of that. Hopefully this is not your last day. I'm just messing with you, but you know. Uh, but pray this prayer with me. Okay, you ready? Say, God, thank you for giving your son Jesus. That he paid the price for my mistakes. He gave his life in exchange for mine. It's hard to imagine. But that's what real love does. So today I'm surrendering my life to you. Asking you to wipe away my past. Give me a brand new future. I'm committing my life to you. From this day forward, I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. Welcome home. Bye. <laughs> Part two. Part two. Your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If you've allowed the circumstances of life to isolate you, open arms today, we're inviting you back to the herd. So if you're struggling trying to defeat one of those giants, is it okay if we are, we're your Abishai today? Could we be your Abishai today? We're going to be that, that, that friend, okay, to invite you back. So as we close this service today, we want you to know that our prayer partners are here to be the Abishai. We're going to be around for the Abishai. Stop by the, the green umbrella out there so, so you can meet a few Abishais, right? We're going to be your friend. We're going, to, we're going to invite you in because you are part of the herd. Do not suffer in the shadows. We're in this together.